Hello everyone, this is Dr. Locklear, and I'm coming to you today with module number two, and our concept is cellular regulation. We're going to begin this exemplar with anemia, which is 2.B, and that starts on page 69 in your volume one textbook. So what are our learning outcomes? What is the pathophysiology of anemia? I want you to pay close attention to page 70 and box 2-3, and it gives you a detailed pathophysiologic mechanism of action, <coughs> excuse me, of anemia. <coughs> and basically, if describing anemia in uh, an easy definition is you just don't have enough hemoglobin or hematocrit to uh, carry the oxygen to the tissues and the cells. And we'll talk way more about that. What is the etiology of anemia? So what causes anemia? It can be blood loss or um, immature red blood cells, uh, a multitude of things. Compare the risk factors for prevention of anemia. So what are the risk factors? What puts someone at risk for having anemia? What are the diagnostic tests and therapies used uh, to help diagnose someone with anemia and to collaborate care on how to treat and further prevent the anemia? People that are anemic often feel very tired and sluggish. It's a very debilitating uh, situation and it needs to be addressed. Our tissues have to have oxygenation to be able to function. And so we have death to the tissues uh, when the hemoglobin and hematocrit is low in the anemia state. And we're going to apply the nursing process in providing culturally competent care. So, you know, some people are very weary in different cultures about getting blood transfusions or anything to do with blood. So we need to be very mindful of what their cultural beliefs are related to blood and blood products. So what is the overview? And this starts on page 69. And anemia happens when the oxygen delivery is not appropriate, it's inadequate. So what causes that is you have the de deficient volume of healthy red blood cells for whatever reason. Maybe the bone marrow um, is producing immature red blood cells uh, too quickly. Uh, they're not uh, having time to mature. <clears throat> uh, other uh, reasons could be blood loss, again, inadequate uh, RBC production, and increased RBC destruction. So, you know, you could be uh, losing red blood cells from blood loss. So that's why in the injury it's so important to stop the bleeding because we know that our red blood cell, that hemoglobin component, carries the oxygen to the tissues and the person will die without lack of oxygenation. Decreased normal hemoglobin, so this can occur from nutritional deficiencies and certain physiologic disorders. And so when you look at the overview in your chapter, it gives you a good definition. It says anemia occurs when oxygen delivery is inadequate as a result of deficient hematocrit, which is the volume percentage of healthy red blood cells, or a decreased amount of normal hemoglobin. And the oxygen does attach to the hemoglobin to be carried to the tissues. <clears throat> symptoms are vague, and fatigue is usually the first symptom. You feel very sluggish and weak, and your skin may be pale. There's a good picture on page 69 comparing someone that's anemic to someone that's not, and you can see the differences of colors in their skin. <clears throat> So what is the patho and the etiology? So anemia reduces oxygen carrying capacity. So when we have anemia, again, we don't have enough oxygen because we don't have enough of the hemoglobin component in the blood to carry the oxygen. Um, <clears throat> uh, if we don't have enough red blood cells, then there's not enough hemoglobin to carry the oxygen. Let me say it that way. When the onset of anemia is slow, then we have some compensatory mechanisms that kick in and they mask the appearance of the symptoms. And then, um, you know, the body compensates, okay? 
But as your body starts to experience tissue hypoxia, then you're going to see changes in your heart rate and things like that uh, because the heart is trying to pump harder to get what blood it does have to the vital organs to, te to keep them going. Uh, tissue hypoxia may cause angina, which is pain in the heart, fatigue, shortness of breath or dyspnea on exertion, night cramps, especially in your legs, and it stimulates erythropoietin release, which causes the RBCs to be produced in the bone marrow, and it can cause bone pain, and it can cause them to be uh, immature red blood cells because it's, it's making it make more blood. And uh, it can be uh, um, immature because it's doing it so fast, which really doesn't help the situation because the immature red blood cell lacks the ability to carry oxygen as well. Some of the other some causes are iron deficiency is the most common. Um, <clears throat> it occurs when there is an insufficient amount of mineral iron present in the body to produce the necessary hemoglobin to make the RBC. Uh, the insufficient iron supply first causes the iron stores in the bone marrow to be depleted. And of course, as these are depleted, then we don't have those iron stores to help make the red blood cell, and then we have a lack of red blood cells. And so um, anemia develops as hemoglobin production continues to decline. Iron deficiency anemia can result from certain conditions such as poor nutritional intake and uh, internal blood losses and in the ability to absorb iron as well. Some of uh, uh, other things, uh, genetics that can't be prevented and then adequate nu nutrition. Uh, we need to educate these patients on eating iron rich foods or they may have to take an iron supplement um, on a daily basis but sometimes with the iron, it does cause constipation and it will stain the teeth. And so the patient needs to be educated on uh, taking iron supplements as, as well. Um, look on page 70. It talks about uh, a word called pica or pica, either way you want to say it. And this is when you have iron deficiency uh, from nutritional problems, especially in children. And so they will eat and crave non-food items that are associated uh, uh, with helping to restore some of the iron. They'll eat like chalk and washing powders and things like that. They just, they're just, their body is craving something to fulfill that iron need. And that term again is called pica or pica. That's on page uh, 70. Uh, clinical manifestations. Um, before I move to that, I want to go back to risk factors on page 70. Again, people who do not eat a healthy, well-balanced diet rich in meats, because we know meat helps supply iron, uh, fish, fresh fruits and vegetables, then we are at increased risk for nutritional deficiencies related to iron stores. Uh, during childbearing years, women who lose blood during the menstruation or during childbirth are at risk as well. That's one of the reasons uh, women often have to take iron after um, having a baby uh, or later in life uh, when uh, they start to experience more blood loss with their menstrual cycle. Inadequate intake of iron can result in reduced production of RBCs and that increases the risk of anemia uh, to related to iron deficiency. Vitamin B12 and folic acid should also be incorporated into the diet to prevent the development of megablastic anemia and promote overall good health. So we need to educate about um, iron rich foods and make sure that the patient you know, can tolerate these foods uh, as well. Uh, during pregnancy, it is highly recommended that the um, in the early trimester that you take folic acid because this helps with uh, neural tube, uh, preventing neural tube defects and it helps develop the neurological system as well. <clears throat> Under clinical manifestations, uh, it's categorized by blood loss, 
Is it coming from a nutritional deficiency? Is it a hemolytic problem? Is there uh, issues with circulation, uh, your blood flow, or bone marrow suppression? And we know that some patients that are taking certain um, chemo drugs can cause bone marrow suppression. Uh, other drugs that can cause that are things like um, uh, for arthritis and uh, eczema, anything that can suppress the um, body's ability to attack itself, that immune system. Um, each type of these has a specific patho and manifestations. And we're going to look at these. So blood loss. So you have loss of RBCs and other blood components. And the blood is very fluid. It has platelets in it, it has plasma in it, and it just doesn't have RBCs. Acute blood loss, this triggers the body to kick in and make my heart beat faster to pump what blood I do have left to the vital organs. Um, so as I lose blood, uh, it becomes less effective, especially during hemorrhaging, and I'm at increased risk for hypovolemic shock, which means hypo means low, and the limit means volume. So I'm losing volume in my circulatory system when I am hemorrhaging and we need to stop the hemorrhaging. If the blood loss continues, you'll see hypotension. So the blood pressure drops because you're losing volume, but the heart rate's gonna go up because it's trying to compensate and pump what blood it does have to the vital organs. You will see a decreased level of consciousness because you're not getting enough oxygen to the tissues because again, you're losing the RBCs and you will see oliguria as well. So your output will change and you won't have as much output um, going out. Um, circulating RBCs of normal size and shape. And so uh, we can have a situation where RBCs are immature and they, they, they're not mature enough to have that hemoglobin and hematocrit component that can carry the oxygen and the shape such as in sickle cell and we will talk about that uh, in cellular regulation uh, when we get to exemplar uh, 2.h. Um, these abnormal shaped cells don't have the ability to uh, carry the oxygen as well. Look on page 71 and it talks about multi-system effects of anemia so respiratory, I'll have increased respiratory rate because I'm trying to get more oxygen in and I'll be short of breath on exertion because we know when we are exerting ourselves, we use more oxygen and the oxygen's not there because the RBC is not capable of, of, of transporting it. <clears throat> you may see hemoglobinuria and so you may have some blood in your urine, uh, gastrointestinal, diarrhea, anorexia, gallstones, your spleen may be enlarged and abdominal pain because as we lose blood, the vessels do react to the uh, volume loss and, it, and the ischemia from lack of the oxygenation. And so you have pain. Again, with musculoskeletal, night cramps, bone pain, uh, night cramps, you're not getting enough mus uh, oxygen to the muscles. So they're pain. They're having pain because that tissue is dying. And then the bone pain is, again, because the bone marrow is trying to produce more. Uh, neurologic, you may have a, a tingling sensation. You, proprioception is off. You may feel dizzy. You may not be able to focus. Uh, no, um, uh, have a feeling of falling, that type of thing. Your gait is, is off balance. Uh, headache, fainting, forgetfulness, pain and behavioral disturbances. Cardiovascular, tachycardia, palpitations, again, because the body's trying to compensate with the neurologic, especially in the brain, you're just not getting enough oxygen and those tissues are dying, it makes us confused. Integumentary, the skin may be pallor or pale and you may see uh, jaundice from uh, the effects of the liver, uh, petechiae, little uh, red spots, um, because um, you've got some rupture of those small blood vessels. Chelosis are uh, sores in the corners of your mouth. Uh, you see that a, a lot with people that have a B12 deficiency. You may see a sore beefy red tongue with B12 deficiency also. And then chronic leg ulcers because you're just, you've got poor circulation to those areas. On page 71, 
you have a key box. <clears throat> Symptoms usually caused by a specific form of anemia, and it lists the anemias for you there. Hemolytic, aplastic, iron deficiency, pernicious, vitamin B12, sickle cell, and G6PD anemia. Please review page 71. Other uh, causes of blood loss, and we're looking at chronic, and this is where fluid shifts from the interstitial space to vessels. It prevents hypovolemia. Reduced blood viscosity may result in a heart murmur. Um, so your fluid is shifting from inside the uh, cell uh, to uh, uh, from inside the cell to the outside. Um, so you're going from interstitial to the outside of the cell walls. Uh, depletes iron stores and RBCs are small and pale. So if for some reason you may have uh, low iron. Uh, it could be you have a hemorrhage on the inside and you don't know. It could be that um, your body's not taking in enough iron. Your body's not able to absorb the iron. Uh, you might see that with um, a B12 deficiency. And then again, the RBCs may be small and uh, immature. Nutritional anemias, and uh, this starts on page 72. Uh, with iron deficiency anemia, you have brittle spoon-shaped nails. You have chelosis, which are those uh, dry, cracked places on your, um, your mouth. And uh, you have a smooth, sore tongue, and you crave those non-food items such as in pica or pica, however you want to say it. Vitamin B12, this is where uh, it's not absorbed through the gut properly. So your body's not absorbing B12, which is um, uh, pernicious anemia. <clears throat> and it's, it develops over time. Uh, you may have pallor, jaundice, weakness, paresthesia. Uh, you may be dizzy and lightheaded, difficulty maintaining your balance. And some of the other symptoms that go along with this, uh, again, is that um, beefy red tongue, um, a sore tongue. Um, the patient has to take a B12 injection uh, once a month to uh, keep their B12 um, up to normal therapeutic levels. Uh, some of the problems with this is, is if you have uh, acid reflux disease or GERDs, um, uh, like esophageal reflux, your, your stomach's irritated so it can't absorb the B12 from the foods that you eat. And so you can't take a B12 pill because your stomach's not going to absorb it. You have to take a monthly injection for this. Uh, other nutritional anemia is folic acid. And again, we've kind of talked about that. Um, here are some of the, the things that you may see, shortness of breath, uh, a swollen tongue, which is glossitis, chelosis, diarrhea, um, you know, and it happens over time. And you see this among undernourished people. Thalassemia, this is an inherited disorder uh, of the hemoglobin. And you see anemia, your spleen will be enlarged, your skin will have a bronzy color and your bone marrow will be hyperplasia. So what that means is your bone marrow is trying to constantly produce um, RBCs at a rapid rate and they're immature. And then acquired hemolytic anemia, this is hemolysis from factors outside of the RBC. Hemolysis means like a splitting or cutting. Uh, so you have mild to moderate anemia and mild to moderate um, uh, enlarged spleen. When it's severe, the bone marrow expands, so your bones become deformed and pathologic fractures may happen. Um, this is acquired hemolytic. Uh, this, all these are on page 72 and 73, and so make sure that you read uh, through those, uh, and we'll talk more about these in class as well. Um, with the hemolytic, you have mechanical trauma to the RBC-produced um, and you may see this with a prosthetic heart. Um, autoimmune disorders can cause this. Uh, certain types of bacterial or protozoal infections, certain types of immune system responses, and then uh, drugs such as toxins and chemical agents and venoms can also cause this as well. And then uh, your G6 phosphate dehydrogenase anemia and this is on page 74. 
And so this is hereditary. It's a hereditary defect in RBC metabolism. It's triggered by certain stressors. And uh, you see pallor, jaundice, hemoglobinuria, and elevated reticulocyte count. Aplastic anemia, and this is on page 74 as well. This is the bone marrow fails to produce all three types of blood cells, which leads to pancytopenia, which is a deficiency in both red and white blood cells. Normal bone marrow is replaced by fat. So, you know, and fat's not going to do what we need it to do. So the bone marrow fails to produce uh, the three types of blood vessels. And so you have pancytopenia, which is a deficiency in red and white blood cells. And we know they both do different things. The normal bone marrow is replaced by fat. So <clears throat> we're not making any red blood cells because the fat's taking over. Uh, the onset is insidious. It may be sudden. Uh, you just don't know what causes it. Uh, fatigue, pallor, weakness, exertional dyspnea, headache, tachycardia, and heart failure. And then Fakoni anemia is a rare form of anemia. And um, uh, we'll uh, talk about this one in class as well. Collaboration. So what do we do to collaborate? Uh, ensure adequate tissue oxygenation is the priority uh, treatment. Specific therapies determine the underlying cause. So, of course, you may need a blood transfusion, iron replacement. If you're B12 deficient, you may need a B12 um, shot every month. You need to have blood work done on a routine basis as your skin becomes more pallor and pale and you become more fatigued. Uh, teach the patient, look for bruising and signs and symptoms of bleeding as well. And report these, of course. Your diagnostic test, of course, the CBC, because that's where the RBC is, the hemoglobin ethematocrit, will be under the CBC. Your iron, ferritin, iron binding capacity, all these, these three uh, relate to your iron stores. And then um, you'll look at a uh, microscopic analysis, a shilling test, a bone marrow exam, and then a quantitative assay of G6PD. And, um, we will talk um, a little bit more about these uh, in class as well. <clears throat> like on the Schilling's test, I'll go, I'll give you a definition of uh, what that is. Surgery, you may need surgery to repair any tissues or organs. Aplastic anemia may require stem cell transplant. Uh, again, pernicious anemia uh, may require surgery to assess for what's causing it. And again, you may have to take B12 um, injections for the rest of your life. Um, so, um, and you have to have um, blood work done um, every time when you're on the uh, B12 injections because you don't want it to, um, to get too high. Uh, if your B12 gets drops too low, uh, you can have oh severe leg pain, confusion, um, night sweats, uh, very vivid dreams. Um, it can cause a lot of lot of problems, and uh, and then thalassemia major may need to, to remove the spleen. And um, I'm going to go back and just give you a definition of the Schilling's test. A Schilling's test is also known as a vitamin B12 absorption test. It was formally used to determine whether a person was absorbing B12 normally. If not, then the test could pinpoint the cause of any B12 deficiency. Um, my resource that I'm using says that Schilling's tests are no longer uh, used. Um, <clears throat> uh, B12 is not is B12 is a vital nutrient for humans. It is not produced naturally in the bowel, in the body. B12 produces red blood cells, keeps our nerves functioning properly. That's one reason you have um, leg pain and your it's like um, your legs are crawling and um, the pain is very, very significant. Most adults get plenty of vitamin B12 from food, but if you have trouble absorbing it through the gut, then you're going to have issues with um, your B12. Uh, pharmacologic therapy. So what are we looking at with pharmacology? Um, depends on the cause. 
So you may be able to supplement it with iron. Um, iron you have to be careful with because some people are allergic to iron and have a hypersensitivity reaction and you have to have iron levels drawn when you're on iron. And again, teach them that um, iron can stain your teeth and it can cause black tarry stools and it can cause constipation. Vitamin B12, again, is an injection that you give once a month, uh, usually in the, um, it's an IM injection. You can give it in the deltoid. Uh, folic acid replacement, erythropoietin injections, that's usually by injections and immunosuppressive therapy. Um, with immunosuppressive therapy, um, it may be used to treat the aplastic anemia. Um, it may stimulate blood cell production in some of some patients with the aplastic. Non-pharmacology, uh, sources of iron, folic acid, B12, so uh, we need to look at the diet and what kind of diet should um, this patient be on. Look on page 75. <clears throat> and box 2-4, and it gives you dietary sources of iron, folic acid, and B12. Uh, please read over this, okay, because I can see this being in a test question. Uh, your, your meats, of course, uh, we know we get iron from meat, and then your brands and vegetables, and then other things such as eggs and milk and stuff like that. Make sure you read over that. Blood transfusions. Uh, if it is from a blood loss and we need to replace volume, then we're going to do a blood transfusion. But here again, um, make sure that um, the patient is willing to get a blood transfusion, okay? And then individuals with thalassemia require blood transfusions throughout the lifespan. It's a constant thing. They constantly have to have one. Um, I want you to look on page 76 and 77 and look at the clinical manifestations and therapies. And you're gonna find, uh, you've probably already used this book in a previous semester, that um, each chapter, each exemplar has the clinical manifestations. I'll always want you to go look at, at those. Um, <clears throat> it gives you the different anemias listed here, and it gives you the clinical manifestations on what a patient would experience, and then the therapies on how to treat it. Please read over that. That's a very good chart, and you're going to find as we go through this class that I really like boxes and charts and things like that for you to refer to. Um, <clears throat> so across the lifespan, neonatal anemia, blood loss, uh, hemolysis, and erythrocyte destruction, so something's destroying the red blood cell and impaired RBC production. This could be a child that's premature, uh, their liver's not developed good, their, 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 their bone marrow's not uh, developed where it should be. Um, you do see uh, anemia a lot in premature infants because their liver and their bone marrow is not fully um, mature enough yet to provide what they need. Uh, physiological anemia of the newborn, it results from a normal gradual drop in the hemoglobin for the first six to 12 weeks. So the bone marrow starts to produce and the anemia disappears. And again, like I said, you'll see this really significant in premature. Uh, infants and children increase need for iron between four and six months and one in six years. And we do this through their diet. You know, um, educate patients on the importance of limiting cow mi milk uh, because they need more than just cow's milk. Um, they need the introduction of, of foods that are uh, rich in iron and some children have to have iron fortified formula uh, to get their iron stores up. And then in young children, uh, you will see deficits of mental and motor development if they're experiencing iron deficiency anemia. And so we want to, uh, you know, see what they need in their nutrition and any supplements. Adolescents, a high requirement for iron, especially girls because of going through the menstrual cycle and losing, you know, uh, volume every month. Adolescents who are overweight or underweight, malnourished or obese are at risk as well because we know that uh, this can affect production of RBCs. And when the RBC is affected, that's when we start to have problems. Pregnant women, Iron deficiency anemia uh, uh, is very common during pregnancy because now 
you, uh, your body is compensating for you and your infant. And so uh, you can have an increased risk of sepsis, maternal and perinatal mortality and low birth weight if the iron is low. That's why women take prenatal vitamins throughout their pregnancy, especially during the first and second trimester. Um, other women of reproductive age, uh, if you have he heavy menstrual cycles and you're losing a lot of blood, you can become iron deficient anemia and have to take uh, supplements. Um, most of these women who have heavy periods end up having a uh, partial hysterectomy, which is just removal of the uterus to stop the bleeding. Older adults, you know, again, as we age, our body just doesn't work as well. Our hemoglobin uh, and hematocrit in the red blood cell uh, may not be as mature. Our bone marrow may not produce as much as we need because our body is aging and we have a change in how we eat and uh, our taste. And so we don't eat as well and we uh, can really become iron deficiency uh, because of these two things, age and uh, poor appetite and poor intake. So the nursing process, this starts on page 78. And so we want to do a good assessment. Um, we want to do screenings at, for patients that are at risk, um, emergent care for acute exacerbations and crises. Um, the patient that's so fatigued, they can't get up, they're mentally confused, they're pale, um, you know, they just, they need a blood transfusion. Uh, Long-term care for patients with anemia is on prevention of the complications. So giving them these supplements and trying to prevent some of the side effects that we can experience from a uh, low red blood cell count, these anemias. And so uh, we want dietary counseling and education. So we want to have observation and patient interview Look at their skin color, their mouth, any bruising or bleeding. What is their balance? Are they short of breath on exertion? Ask them, do they feel short of breath? Do you feel tired and fatigued? Are you having weakness? Do you feel dizzy when you change positions or stand up? Um, do you faint when you change positions? Are you having heart palpitations? And you'll see the list here, um, the medicines and the menstrual cycle and diet and alcohol, because we know alcohol um, affects absorption issues in our gut as well. The physical exam, what's the general appearance? Are they weak? Are they pale? Um, are they short of breath? Are their vital signs abnormal, heart rate up, blood pressure low, uh, their skin color, their mucous membranes? Listen to their heart and lungs. Uh, look at their capillary refill. It'll be sluggish. And do they have any abdominal tenderness from the enlarged spleen? Bleeding or bruising, look at, look, do, do a very thorough skin assessment. Make sure you turn your patients over and look at their backside as well. That's so important. Uh, your nursing diagnoses, uh, these are listed on page 78. Impaired gas exchange, risk for decreased cardiac output, acute pain, uh, and so forth. Activity and type, fatigue, um, all of these you know, and I would add on here at risk for falls because of the dizziness and the weakness. Goals, uh, report any absence of dizziness. So we want the patient to know to report, um, you know, that there's an absence of dyspnea, uh, verbalize awareness of exacerbations. Does the patient know when their situation with anemia is worsening? We need to educate them. Implementation. And we want to look at vital signs, again, looking at heart rate, blood pressure, pulse. Uh, sometimes you may run a fever. Um, look at skin color, uh, uh, the cyanosis, is, uh, you know, your lips blue, any dependent edema and, uh, excuse me, edema. Closely monitor for anaphylaxis when you're administering any of these iron uh, preparations because you can have a reaction to any type of medicine. Facilitate enhanced care, monitor the lips and tongues for glossitis and chelosis. Mouthwash, and you want to use a mild mouthwash because if your tongue is beefy red, you don't want to burn your tongue. Uh, frequent oral hygiene, and again, you don't want to use something that's going to burn the inside. Uh, you want to use KY jelly to the lips, uh, soft, cool, bland food, foods because that helps cool the mouth. 
and four to six small high protein and high vitamin meals a day that are rich in iron and rich in folic acid. And then your expected outcomes, always with expected outcomes, we want the patient to return to a level of normal limits and be able to function uh, back to their normal state of functioning. So you see these listed here for you.